Is Jesus enough for you? Is Jesus enough for you? Because we might say, well, everything actually seems to be going okay in my life just now. Like, people don't really seem to know how much of a mess I really am. Do I, do I really need to confess anything? Do I really need to bring it out in the open and make it real and, and make radical changes to my life? Because everything seems to be fine. Does it really matter if I'm only like on the fence about Jesus? I'll, I'll jump off eventually. Why does it really matter if I'm a bit of a hypocrite? Well, it matters because there's going to be a day of judgment. Uh, a, a time of dividing is coming and actually has come upon us if we open our eyes to see it. But there's coming a day when all will see it. Even the blind will see the divide. It will be like sheep and goats. It will be like wheat and chaff. The divide will be as clear as the difference between the living and the dead. And Jesus wants us to see that difference now, today. He wants us to see the world for what it really is. So that we won't be fooled into living a shadow life. Because Christianity really, really and truly is much, much more than just slapping a gospel veneer on top of a materialistic worldview. Being a Christian is more than just adding Jesus to your life and getting on like everyone else. No, it is a radical call out of the world because the world is dying. And it is, the world is doing everything it can to make you think that it is big and strong and vibrant. So that you will give yourself to it and prop it up. It will tell you to fear it. And it will promise you all sorts of things. But Jesus wants you to know it is toothless. It's all bark and no bites. It cannot give you anything real. And he wants you to know that he will save all who believe that he really is enough. So let's get into chapter 12 as we see all of this. Verse 1. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first. So this is a continuation from last week. Do you see that? In the meantime, Jesus is eating in the Pharisee's house. And while he's, uh, you know, having it out inside the house, outside, people have all heard that he's there and they're, they're gathering in. Maybe they've heard what he's saying to the Pharisees. Like, oh, I want to I hear that. And loads of people are gathered outside the house to come and see Jesus. So many, that they're trampling each other. Seeing all of this, before Jesus kind of speaks to anyone else, perhaps before he even steps outside the house, before he moves on from what's happened at dinner, he turns to his disciples and says, Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Why does Jesus say that hypocrisy is like leaven, like yeast? Well, we know, don't we, from our time in Leviticus, that leaven was always the picture of an image of sin and the pleasures and treasures of this world. If you are living for this world and its praise, you will always be tempted to hypocrisy. Putting on a show, putting on a display to cover who you are so that you can succeed in this world. And what's more, it only takes a little bit of leaven to spread through the whole loaf. And that's what hypocrisy is like. It spreads. Once you start... It's really hard to stop. Once people have got a favourable picture of you, it's then really hard to be honest about who you are. And you become addicted to man's praise. And Jesus says, beware. Beware about living for this world. Why? Well, because all will be revealed. Verse 2. Nothing, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms 
will be proclaimed from the housetops. You may think that you're getting away with it, but God in heaven isn't fooled. He sees it all. And do you know what? Other people are not going to be fooled forever either. Because a day is coming where everything you have spoken in the dark, anything you've ever said, those things you said when you thought nobody else was around to hear, everything you've ever thought will be revealed. And so all we see is hypocrisy has a shelf life. There's only so long it's going to last. Now, in the light of what Jesus says here, I just wanted to round up and apply some of what we heard last week as well. Because as clear as Jesus' teaching is, it can still leave us with questions as to how we apply it. How should we behave? What should we do when there's darkness inside of us? Because there's a temptation to take Jesus' teaching and twist it and say, well, I don't want to be a hypocrite, so I will just be you know, just be yourself. If you're rotten, if you're rotten and if you're a rotten and evil person, don't act holy, just be horrible. You, you, you know, if there's any sin in, in you, any vile thought, just say it out loud. Get it all out in the open. I'm just being true to myself. At least I'm not a hypocrite. You know, we've all done it, haven't we? Said what we're thinking, well, it's just who I am. I'm just being honest. We've just done a vile and horrible thing to somebody and it's broken them down. Well, I'm just being honest as if it's a virtue. Or I'm just not feeling it today. I don't feel like a Christian. I don't feel like a joyful, satisfied person. Actually, I feel angry and I feel depressed and I shouldn't fake it. So I'm just going to be grumpy. I'm just going to be short tempered with the kids. I'm just going to be mean to my friends. That is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying that there should be more cruelty and evilness acted out in the world. No. He is saying, act right. But do it not to please man, but to please God. Yes, acknowledge to others. Confess, I am struggling today. I am anxious. I am unsatisfied. I am grumpy. Confess that you are battling. Confess you are battling inwardly, but don't be. Don't give in to it. Don't be satisfied with the hollow life. Jesus isn't saying don't try. He's not saying don't pursue real life in me. He's saying don't be fake. Make it real. So when you don't feel like praying, that's not a good reason not to pray. Or it'd be disingenuous. No, it wouldn't. That's exactly when you need to pray. Lord, I feel cold towards you. Warm my heart. Lord, I don't know what to say. I I kind of feel angry. Help me. Warm my devotion. That prayer is an act of faith. To pray believing that Jesus can take your heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. That's not hypocritical. It's faith. Praying when you don't feel like it because you know it's the only thing that makes sense. It's not hypocritical. It's faith. Trying to be kind and warm to people even when you don't feel like it. Because you believe that you have been placed where you are to show Jesus' love and care for others even when you don't feel full of the joys of spring, it's not hypocritical, it's faith. And it doesn't always mean that warm feelings of joy and happiness will follow. We don't do these things to feel better about ourselves. We do them because they they are the only things that make sense in this mad world. We do them because we believe that this is what participating in the life of Jesus really looks like and we know that it is him who we need and so Jesus encourages his disciples verse 4 I tell you my friends do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do but I will warn you whom to fear fear him who after he is killed has authority to cast into hell yes I tell you Fear him. We do tend to be afraid of what people think of us. 
You know, if I, if I say this, then they might think I'm weird, or they might not want to be my friend, or whatever it might be. Well, Jesus takes that and takes it to the most extreme example. He says, you're worried about putting on an outward show, trying to please people because, yeah, people might kill you for what you believe. That, they might go that far. They might actually kill you for being a Christian. But Jesus says, do not fear those who kill the body. Don't fear people who can only kill your body. Don't be worried about that. That's not even a problem. That's not even a thing, says Jesus. He's almost like, why would you even, why would you even worry about that? Because you're with me and I made you. I am life. You shouldn't even be worried about people killing you, and yet you're worried about what people may say or think. But who can cast you into hell? Who can cast you into the second final death? God. You should be worried about what God thinks when he looks at you. You see, I, I, I'm not saying this glibly at all. I, I mean this with every fibre of my being. Death, your death is certain, short of the Lord returning. Your death is certain. It's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to each and every one of us. And I, let me ask, what does it really matter if you die from illness, accident, old age, or being crucified for your faith? What difference does it really make? Because all of it brings you to the same place. All of it. Brings you to the same place, the judgment seat of God. It's what happens then that really matters. If you are a Christian, what have they really done by killing you other than sending you to the kingdom of God? In fact, St. Ambrose even said that the death of the body is not itself a punishment, but rather it marks the end of earthly punishments. Don't, do not be false and act and speak in certain ways to please man, to get them to be nice to you. Our efforts in this world are to please God alone. Verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. Now, this again is often misquoted, in the, uh, misquoted by people. Often used to say, nothing bad will happen to you. God loves you. But that's not what this verse is saying. Jesus is building on what he's already said. He's saying, yes, these people can kill you. They can fire you from your job. There are numerous bad things they can do to you. But if you are living in the love of God, you don't need to worry about what those things may be. Because God is not going to forget about you and leave you to these people. That's what this is about, God not forgetting you, even when there, you are in these bad times. Because that's when there's great temptation to doubt, isn't it? When hard times come, when depression and anxiety and illness crowd in and, and cover us over, and in the fog of it all, we can be tempted to believe that God has forgotten about us. Can he see me under all of this? Does he know I'm still here? Have I fallen off of his radar? And Jesus says, no. No. I have not forgotten about you. I will bring you through. You know, there, there are going to be those who God does forget. At the judgment to come, there will be those who will hear the chilling words, depart from me, I never knew you. Some of those people are going to be church people. Because they're, they're like, oh Lord, we did this for you, we did that for you. I don't know you. Because actually you weren't all about me. And I wasn't enough for you. There will be those who hear that. But Jesus says, it isn't you, my disciples, those who live for my kingdom. 
those for whom I am enough. Verse 8. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. The only reason, other than unbelief, that someone would not confess Jesus would be fear of man, fear of people. And these beautiful words of Jesus, uh, Luke has recorded for his readers because Luke, Luke's, uh, and Luke's first readers particularly, and others throughout history, were going to be killed and tortured for confessing Christ. For saying, no, I'm a Christian. I worship the one true God. And in the face of emperors like Nero and other vile oppressors of Christians, it would be easy to be overwhelmed in the force of the world that is coming against you and then to shrink in fear. But in that moment, Jesus wants us to know, he wants us to remember. He says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you in heaven. Whatever you are facing on earth, hold on to me. Remember me. Trust me. Trust me. I will not forget about you. I will bring you through and I will speak your name in heaven. Verse 10. Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. I found that discussions around this verse uh, usually generate a lot of heat and not a lot of light. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the, the unforgivable sin. Um, but what is it that Jesus is saying here? Well, I think the meaning is pretty clear. He simply says, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you will not, you cannot be forgiven whilst ever you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But people want to know, well, what does that mean? So let's just get some real clarity on this. And this is where paying attention to Luke's grammar is going to be really important. Over these past few weeks, as we've been going through Luke, we'll hopefully have picked, on, picked up on quite a few of the conjunctions at the beginning of our passages. So we've had, in the meantime, as he went away from there, while he was speaking, yeah? So these sentences join all of these events together into one narrative. And where, so we're still in this one big section, and where it began was right the way back, at the beginning of chapter 11, in the Lord's Prayer. That was for us six weeks ago. So we've been having this kind of one long, in the meantime, you know, one long section of narrative. In this section, who is it that has spoken against the Holy Spirit? Cast your mind back to chapter 11, verse 15. Jesus cast out an unclean spirit, and what did some of the people say? Well, what did they say? They said, they said, they said the spirit in Jesus was a demon. And who actually is the spirit in Jesus? It's the Holy Spirit. Okay? Since that event, Jesus has largely been talking about the group of people who were kind of sitting on the fence about Jesus. You know, the group who wanted a sign, who for whom the word was not enough, they, who heard his word but didn't get it. Even the Pharisees are a version of this, aren't they? They spent the whole life studying the word, but they still didn't get it. They wanted more from Jesus. And now, Jesus is coming back to those other people, the people who pointed at the Holy Spirit and said, that's Beelzebub, that's Satan. That is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That is to look at God and say, that's Satan. That's evil. He's bad. Jesus is saying, if you want to say something about me, well, that's one thing. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. <laughs> but, but to call the Spirit of God, to call the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the devil, to call God Satan, that won't be forgiven you. Why? Because it can't. It can't. If you think God is evil and you hate God, how can he welcome you into his presence for all eternity? You wouldn't want to be there, right? 
Being in the presence of God, there is actually, being in the presence of God and hating him for all eternity is what hell is. Being in the presence of God and hating him for all eternity is called hell. Because God is present in hell in his judgments. By definition, it is possible it is impossible to hate the Holy Spirit, to hate God, to hate Jesus and be in heaven. What does Jesus mean then by speaking against the Son of Man? Who well, who is the Son of Man? It's Jesus, isn't it? And who is he speaking to? Remember, he's speaking to the disciples. And what are all of them going to do? They're all going to run. They're all going to deny Jesus in one way or another. They're going to betray him, publicly deny him, run and hide. And Jesus says, that can be forgiven them. Even that can be forgiven them. But if they treat God as evil, there is no forgiving them. What has Jesus really been talking about in this passage this morning? Well, he's been talking about the day of judgment, hasn't he? Um, Everything hidden revealed. Fear the one who cast into hell. Jesus will recognise you before the angels. If you die as a Christian, someone who loves, follows and obeys Jesus, is filled with the Holy Spirit, when you come before the living God in all his splendour on that final day, when he judges all the earth, and he judges the hearts and minds of man. If you stand before the living God and say, Lord God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm a mess. I've sinned so much. I repent of all my sins and lying and stealing and lust and gossip and fornication and witchcraft. Father, forgive me because you are a good God and I plead nothing but the blood of Christ with whom I've entrusted my life. God will say, you are forgiven, my child. Come, enter into life everlasting. But if you die rejecting the Holy Spirit, convinced that God is bad, convinced that he is evil, if you die not following the divine human Jesus, and you come to the last judgment and stand before God, and you're like, oh, Jesus was God after all. My bad. It'll be too late. Everyone will know it then. Every knee will bow. But it'll be too late. It's not going to be forgiven you. It can't. There is no purgatory. There is no place where you can go to hell for a little while uh, until you've worked enough to get off the hook and, and come around. Because this is, and this is Jesus' final point here. There will only be one judgment. There will only be one judgment at verse 12. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rules and the authorities, when they bring you before the courts and judgment of men, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. When they bring you before the rules and authorities, don't be anxious, because there's only one judgment, and this ain't it. This is nothing. This is some kangaroo court that has no power. Don't be afraid what they will do. Only God's judgment matters. And what's more, you shouldn't even be worried about what to say. Don't try and be clever. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to say, which will be, I follow Jesus. You should too. And so in all of this, the point was not, if you have faith, then nothing bad will happen to you. Clearly. That's not what Jesus is saying, is he? It's that if you have faith and trust in God, then when these bad things happen to you, when the earthly trial comes, whether it be literally a trial in the courts, whether it be a trial in the court of public opinion, or in the court of the hospital ward, or the court of the poverty line, When these bad things happen to you, you will be delivered through. God cares for you. He will remember you on that great day of judgment. 
If Jesus can see you through the divine course of heaven on that great day of judgment, will he not see you through this? Even if they kill you, all they will do is deliver you into the hands of Jesus. This is increasingly important to believe because church is clashing with society more now than it has in a long time. Things have generally been going downhill for Christianity for, for a few decades, but there has been what we might call this legacy of Christianity. For many years, there haven't been as many Christians, but people have still basically behaved themselves. They would still largely act the way their Christian grands would, but they didn't actually have the Jesus that their grands had. And so the behaviour was just a shadow, a tradition, a legacy. But what we're seeing now as we read the papers and we watch the news is that legacy is coming to an end, deeply and abruptly. The influence of past generations is fading because we are now in a place where culture is living in a way that's completely opposite to what the Bible says. And so those people who were behaving purely out of tradition or legacy, well, they're not going to do it anymore. Why? Because why would you choose discomfort and a clash with your friends in society if all that you have is an empty shell of Christianity anyway? This is what we are facing. This is what our children are facing. And this is why we must make church and Christianity real for our children. It's not just a veneer that we can paint on top of a materialistic world. It's not an add-on. It's not just a story that we tell ourselves to help life make sense. It is a completely new life, a new world, the real world. And so we baptise them into this kind of life so that Jesus will fill them and help them. Let me say, we are not squeamish about when people accuse us of brainwashing our children. You bet we are. In baptism and in bringing them to church, their brains and bodies are washed free from the enchantment of this world. The thing is, people just don't like what we're washing them with because they want our kids. You better believe they want to take our kids for themselves and their God-forsaken ideas and agendas. No, we do not leave our children to decide for themselves. I've seen it said time and time again, but there's not a whole lot of successes with that plan. We think we're making it fair for our children. Oh, I don't want to force my ideas on them. I want them to come to faith by themselves. Why? Why? Why would you leave them to find it themselves? All we're doing is making it a fair fight for the devil. All we do is we leave our children as fallow ground for the world to cultivate and lie to. And then we wonder why they don't choose Jesus when they're older. It's because we've shown them that Jesus isn't really worth pushing or fighting for. And don't worry, or do worry... Because our kids, even if we baptise them and bring them up in church, they are still capable of rejecting Jesus. Well enough when they're adults if they really want to. But if we baptise them and wash them and feed them and pray for them and tell them and show them that this real life of heaven in church is real, wow. Wow. The chances of them wanting to walk away from Jesus, well, it becomes unthinkable to them because they believe and have experienced themselves that this is real. But they're not going to believe it's real unless we live and speak as though it is. Did you know that in the first century, the Roman Emperor Nero killed Christians? He he hung them on a cross and he covered them in tar and he set them on fire and he often used them as torches at his parties. 
He hated Christians. Do you know why? It's because he said Christians are haters of humanity. That's what he said. He said Christians were haters of humanity. And what he meant by that is he was saying what I think is good for my people, the Christians stand against it. They hate where I want my society to go. They hate where I want society to go. And that is becoming the case again. The way that the Bible teaches us to live, the world no longer looks at it and goes, oh, isn't that sweet? Isn't that funny? They're funny little beliefs and fairy tales. Bless them. They don't say that anymore. They say that's immoral, what you believe. That's evil. We want to snuff that out. Those Christians stand for things that we call hateful. And so, you can sit on the fence, you can try and appease the masses, and try and live comfortably in the world for now, buy into its economy of pleasures and treasures, but when the time comes, and it will, it will only make it harder for you and your children to follow Jesus. We need to radically get off the fence and stop fearing the world and what it says. In the next few years, jobs will be lost, promotions missed, laws passed, and prisons will be filled with people who stand for the Bible, as is already happening in other parts of the world. And do you know what? Moral and legal campaigning will just, it won't do it. It won't cut it. Those things can preserve the husk. They can preserve the legacy of good behaviour, maybe. But only Jesus, the divine emperor who changes hearts and minds and brings life, can fix this. And so we are fixed on preaching him. Christ crucified and risen. There is no social credit left in church. There is no one coming for that anymore. There's no one coming for the Christmas services and the Easter service to, you know, stamp their card and and get the the currency they need for the year. It's not going to be possible to believe in God and hang in there if what you really want is worldly comforts. But, but it will be okay if what you really want is more than this world has to offer. It sounds a bit bleak, doesn't it? But it's only bleak if we want what this world has to offer. But if we really want Jesus, if you really want him, if you confess him before men, then Jesus is concerned with saving and freeing his people with something far greater than worldly comforts. He wants to feed us with himself, with the glorious eternal life of the Father. So it will be okay, whatever befalls us. It will be okay for the Christians. That that is the gospel. Wherever he takes us, he is enough. The apostles were crucified upside down. Jesus is enough. The apostles were boiled in oil. Jesus is enough. Isaiah was sawn in half. Jesus is enough. James was thrown off a building. Jesus is enough. Spurgeon had depression all the days of his life and died. Jesus is enough. And all of these, all of them, are more alive now than they have ever been before. What are you facing? Do you believe that Jesus is enough? Because I promise you he is. I promise you. Ask, pray for the eyes of faith to see the world for what it is and to see Jesus for who he is and then walk boldly upon the earth confessing Jesus. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.